Good evening, everyone. We can see that you're entering into the room for tonight's webinar from the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. Tonight's webinar, Essential Burbank, All About Luther Burbank, is being brought to you by the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. And as you enter the room, we want to also welcome those of you that are joining us on Facebook Live. Tonight's webinar is presented on Zoom and simultaneously brought to us live on Facebook. A few logistics before we get started. For tonight's webinar, we will see our presenters on screen as well as their presentation slides. Our guests and participants will not be seen on screen and we will not hear from our participants except through the chat. So if you have questions, you are more than welcome to key them in via our chat. And we will be facilitating the questions after the presentation. So again, you can key in your questions on the chat bar, but we won't be facilitating them until after the presentation. So you can hold those questions because this presentation has a lot of answers throughout you might be surprised that your question will actually become an answer shortly after you key it, key it in. So please be patient. And this presentation may take up to a full hour. After that hour, we will facilitate all the questions, not only on the Zoom chat, but also those questions that are being keyed in to our Facebook Live post. We have an administrator available on Facebook, and that administrator will take your questions from Facebook and key them in to our Zoom chat. So thank you to them. And now we would like to get going. The Historical Society of Santa Rosa is bringing you tonight's webinar, Essential Burbank, all about Luther Burbank. And we are very proud to present to you our presenters. A little bit about them. Our presenters tonight are Rebecca Baker. She is the archivist and historian at the Luther Burbank Home and Gardens. She and Lisa Kranz both are longtime docents at this historic site. And Lisa is also the secretary of the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. It is a pleasure to have them both here. And now, as they get started, I will leave the screen, but I will be keeping an eye on that chat. Please remember that your chat questions will not be facilitated until after the webinar presentation. Thank you for joining us. And now to Rebecca and Lisa. Thank you, Leslie. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And there is so much to tell about Luther Burbank, who was a very inventive and innovative man. But today we're going to focus on a handful of things you may not have heard about him. But first we'd like to provide just a little bit of background. Luther Burbank was a world renowned horticulturist. It was his dream to make the world a better place by improving plants, particularly food plants. He worked as a plant breeder for more than 50 years. And during that time, he introduced over 800 new varieties of plants. So if you think about that number a little bit, that equates to about one new plant every 23 days, which is a pretty amazing accomplishment. The work that he did made Burbank an agricultural celebrity. It also made him internationally famous. Burbank is probably best known for the Burbank potato, which is shown here. He's also very well known for the Santa Rosa plum, among other plum introductions. He's also very well known for the Shasta daisy. And Burbank is pictured here on the porch of his Tupper Street house, which we'll talk about in a little while. And he is surrounded by beautiful Shasta daisies. This, this slide shows another shot of the Shasta Daisy, uh, more of a studio shot, also lovely. 
While other plant breeders often focused on a single species, Burbank was unique among horticulturists in that he was curious about a very wide variety of plants and he felt that he could improve upon most of them. Here, you see Burbank's thoughts on nature. Nature is our only reliable and authentic teacher. I cannot help but feel that natural law works toward improvement, if not toward perfection. Luther Burbank came to Santa Rosa in 1875 to work hand in hand with nature. In Santa Rosa, the climate was conducive to year round plant experimentation and the development of horticultural novelties. Burbank married his wife, Elizabeth Waters, in 1916. She had, had worked as his secretary and she kept his legacy alive after his death in 1926. Burbank utilized a wide variety of methods to achieve his goal of creating bigger fruit, better yielding vegetables, or larger blooming flowers. Part of his genius was seeing special qualities in plants and selecting those for future experimentation. Food was really different 125 years ago when Burbank was working than it is now. Markets didn't have the wide selection of fruits, vegetables, and flowers that we enjoy today. There were very few choices or variety, and people were really eager for better garden products. And that's where Burbank comes in. So born in 1849 in Lancaster, Massachusetts, Burbank was his father's 13th child, but his mother's first surviving child. Her first two children died very young. The family lived in a home they shared with Luther's brother's family, Luther's father's, I'm sorry, Luther's father, Samuel, and his brother Aaron shared this home together. And the family was New England through and through. The family went back hundreds of years in Massachusetts, originating first in England. Luther's father Samuel was a brick maker and a person that Luther later described as a man of imagination and a facile mind who loved beauty and sunshine and pleasantness of the land. He loved his children tenderly and gave to each the best care and education. His mother, Olive, was the parent who really inspired his life's work. Luther described her as shrewd and practical with an unusual bent for making things grow. One of his earliest memories was of peace and beauty and fragrance in his mother's garden. Initially, Luther's interests lie in becoming an artist. Although his father pushed him to become a doctor. And growing up, Luther was especially close with his sister Emma, something that we continue throughout both of their lives. As a teen, he spent summers in his uncle Luther Ross's woodworking shop turning wood on a lathe and dreaming up improvements to the equipment. We have some examples of Bur Burbank's woodworking. In the Luther Burbank collection here in Santa Rosa. When Luther's father Samuel died in December of 1868, at 19, Luther and his mother and his sister moved out of his uncle's home Luther eventually bought a property in Lunenburg, Massachusetts, and inspired by his cousin, Levi Burbank, a naturalist, and by reading a work by Charles Darwin, Luther began to work with plants full time.
With the proceeds from the sale of his farm in Lunenburg and his first success, the Burbank potato, Burbank came to Santa Rosa in 1875. He started his nursery business and made enough money that enabled him to purchase the property, including the house that we know as the Burbank home in 1884. The house was about nine years old when he bought it, making it nearly 150 years old today. Soon thereafter, Burbank purchased the Goldridge Farm in Sebastopol, where there was a small cottage as shown on this slide, and a cottage, a cottage remains there today. Now Burbank would travel to Sebastopol several times a week, and it took about 90 minutes to get to Sebastopol in those days before the automobile, and Burbank would either uh, take a horse and buggy and sometimes he would ride his bicycle to make that trip. In June 1906, Burbank moved into a house on Tupper Street that he had built right across the street from the original house. Burbank needed a larger house to accommodate visitors and this one was a 14 room pink stucco house where he lived until his death. His mother lived in this house as well with him until her death in 1909. And one of the unique features on this slide that you might notice kind of on the left hand side is an early street sign that shows that we're right at the corner of Tupper, which came all the way out to Santa Rosa Avenue when the house was built and for many years thereafter. Now this photo shows the interior rich with wood. It's one of a few photographs we have of the interior. We, we hope to find others someday, but uh, this shows the, uh, the interior of the house on Tupper Street. This photo shows the office and souvenir shop also called the Information Bureau on this postcard shown on this slide. And this was at the corner of Tupper and Santa Rosa Avenues, as you see, proximate to the house on Tupper Street, right on the corner. And that uh, souvenir shop office information bureau uh, can now be viewed at the Henry Ford Greenfield Village Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. This uh, slide shows his wife, Elizabeth, and she lived in the house with Burbank from 1916, which is the year that they married until he died 10 years later. Mrs. Burbank then remodeled and moved into the original house where she lived until her death in 1977. This is a photograph of the remodeling work that Mrs. Burbank undertook. And this slide shows some of our speculation about the remodeling work that she did do there. So we're still trying to learn more about that, how the house was before she remodeled. And in the early 1960s, there was some debate about whether two Burbank homes should be saved and whether Santa Rosa needed two Burbank homes at all. But the Urban Renewal Agency had purchased the newer home, which had been used as a business school and later, by the Salvation Army for use as a children's nursery and Sonoma Avenue was to be rerouted through that property. Ultimately, the house was removed in early 1964. You can see the, the demolition of that house here. Sonoma Avenue was built through the property where the house once stood. So Luther Burbank's accomplishments were many. Early on, after his father's death, when Burbank was 19 years old, on his truck farm in Lunenburg, Massachusetts, he built, he said, the Burbank potato. This slide shows some of the 
early newspaper accounts and discussion of the merits of the potato. Uh, we know this potato today as the foundation for the ubiquitous russet Burbank or Idaho potato. In addition to its progeny being the top producer, even today, the potato gave Burbank the confidence and funded his move to Santa Rosa, where he started in business. A business first called Santa Rosa Nurseries. And here he could grow year round. And they were the first plants he worked with were standards, normal plants um, that he brought to the public in the best shape possible. You can see from this advertisement, he included new plants from Japan and other countries in his offerings at the Santa Rosa Nursery. As he became more successful, he bought more land so he could focus on horticultural novelties, new unique plants that interested him and plants that could be valuable or interesting to others. In 1893, Luther Burbank produced a groundbreaking catalog called New Creations in Fruits and Flowers. On the catalog itself, it said, keep this catalog for reference. You will need it when these fruits and flowers become standards of excellence. The catalog of New Creations was noted at the time as remarkably unique. Burbank's field was considered a particularly useful one to occupy, where Burbank stood alone. Burbank developed hundreds of plum and prune varieties during his career. The vast majority of his work, in fact, involved plums and prunes. This work began in 1885 when he imported a box of plums from Japan This resulted in the introduction of the successful Botan or Abundance, the Satsuma, and the Burbank. In 1906, he introduced a complex hybrid called the Santa Rosa Plum, which is remarkably still in cultivation more than 120 years later. This beautiful specimen was called the Shipper, later the Market Man and was a seedling of the Satsuma. Burbank sold it to John Lewis Childs, who first introduced it in 1893. In 1901, the Shasta Daisy first came to market after 17 years of development, and again, still wildly popular today. He also brought many more new plants to the market that he obtained from other countries. including the Chinese hairy plum. This is a page from one of his catalogs. That's of course, what is known today as the kiwi. He also introduced the fajoa. This is another catalog page, which is what we know today as the pineapple guava. He introduced celosia. This is the back of one of his catalogs, the back page and amaranthus, among many, many others, he imported from other countries and subsequently improved or offered directly to the market. His work with plants to bring fairer flowers and better fruits to people using the scientific principles of evolution that he learned from Darwin's work meant that it was important to him to advocate for the teaching of evolution in schools. He believed that science was not the enemy of religion and that it should be used to better people's lives, an issue that is not settled even today. So how did Burbank accomplish all of the things that he did? As Rebecca indicated, he started a nursery, but he considered himself a plant inventor. Now, this is a tough slide to read, we acknowledge, but 
up in the little purple box in the area that has people indicate their occupation, Burbank called himself a new plant originator or evoluter of new forms of plant life for economic purposes. So it was hard to fit that in the space that was allotted, I think, but that was a unique um, job description that he provided. While Burbank was not college educated, he did consider himself a man of science. He studied at a prep school for Harvard and Yale, but when his father died, he had to quit school to help support the family. He attended lectures and he read widely, in particular Darwin's Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication. And he said that he walked in Darwin's footsteps. He was self-taught and he used his experience and intuition to capitalize on promising plant innovations. We do know that he did not, he did not read Darwin's most well-read and popular work on the origin of species. And this quote shows Darwin's influence. Daily, I am working on new plant species, which I produce through evolution combining, fusing, and bringing together the best features of certain plants to produce something finer and better yet are produced through a knowledge of the laws of evolution and which can be produced in no other way. Burbank used many methods in the garden, including grafting and budding. And an example of grafting is shown on this slide. But it was really his cross-pollination of plants that revolutionized horticulture. Generally, this is applying pollen from one plant onto the pistil of another plant. As a result, each seed has half of its genes from two plants. When these seeds are planted, they produce a new plant. Burbank would then select plants that had characteristics that he wanted and continue to experiment with those. For some of his introductions, he crossed and selected plants known as selective breeding for years before introducing them to the public. And this is the case with the Shasta daisy, which Rebecca already mentioned. He used four daisies to develop the Shasta daisy and he perfected that over 17 years, but continued to work on for the rest of his life. And you can see the inset on this slide shows Mount Shasta is the word, Mount Shasta for which the Shasta daisy is named. To conduct extensive plant experiments, Burbank needed land. So this slide shows a site plan of his property when he bought it. It had more than four acres. This is the Santa Rosa property. So in the top left hand of the slide, you'll see the location of the house and Santa Rosa Avenue or Main Street as it was known then is on the left-hand side, Tupper Street on the top of the slide, Charles Street on the bottom. And you can see that he owned a good portion of land there, more than four acres. And that's where the house uh, remains today. And there's about an acre and a half that um, makes up the property today. And this just is an old shot, a postcard of the site. And you can see the houses around the property, but much more extensive gardens than exist today. So we talked just a little bit about the Goldridge Farm previously, but when Burbank bought it in 1885, it had 18 acres, and it was there that he was really able to expand his plant experimentation on a more grand scale and also include large trees. Burbank employed around 12 to 25 workers for eight months of the year and about eight to 12 the other four months of the year. And Burbank generally worked every day of the week, usually 10 hours a day or often 10 hours per day. 
And it said that he could scrutinize up to 10,000 seedlings in a half an hour's time. He would walk along the rows of plants, select the plants with qualities that he wanted to experiment with further, and a worker would follow him, tying a cloth on the plants to be saved. And all of the rest of the plants were pulled up and burned. Burbank's neighbors called them the $10,000 bonfires. And Burbank said, to burn 65,000 hybrid blackberries in one pile, as I once did, after saving perhaps half a dozen vines, is an unavoidable incident in the search for perfect fruits. There were some very large bonfires of plant materials, as this slide shows, because Burbank chose a small percentage of seedlings for future use. Through his work over time, Burbank made a good income by selling plants to individuals, businesses, and dealers who resold them. When he died in April 1926, his estate was appraised at more than $168,000 and included the Santa Rosa and Sebastopol properties. His sole heir was his wife, Elizabeth, who's shown here in her later years in the gardens, and she lived in what we know as the Burbank home for more than 50 years after Burbank's death. So Luther Burbank worked to order in some cases. He created plants that were requested by various um, nurseries, individuals. In particular, this $10,000 beauty has a long backstory that we will not get into. <laughs> Suffice it to say that it was announced that Burbank had um, the possibility of a $10,000 reward if he supplied a beautiful yellow rose to Charles Hinsdale Perkins. Um, you may recognize Perkins as the founder of one of the founders of Jackson and Perkins, which is in business still today. Similarly, Burbank worked with a company called Empson P Company uh, on commission from J.H. Empson beginning in 1905 and developed or improved several varieties of peas to go into their canned pea products, including this 1913 ideal deal worth $25,000 that was mentioned here. Luther Burbank employed dozens of on-site helpers, maybe hundreds, over his 40-year career. Some of those helpers were people from other countries. In this case, Nobumi Hasegawa of Japan is pictured here in Luther Burbank's greenhouse with Mr. Burbank. Mr. Hasegawa went on to produce scholarly work about genetic deviations in plants. And when Luther died, he wired money from New York for a garland to be displayed at Burbank's funeral. Prince Albert of Belgium visited Luther Burbank one summer at the age of 25 in 1900. He and Luther Burbank explored the countryside together. 20 years later, he visited Santa Rosa again as the King of Belgium with his wife, Queen Elizabeth, and a large entourage shown here in front of Luther's Tupper Street home. But Burbank's day-to-day -day employees were the most important to him. We know of two families who worked with him for many years, the Holbert family and the Bertino family. You can see in the top left-hand slide, 
two members of the Bertino family. They're the first two people pictured on the slide. In fact, Bert Bertino, the patriarch of the Bertino family, helped Mr. Burbank with plants and with publicity. This is actually an image from a glass slide that was sold as a souvenir by the Keystone Company. The glass slide and accompanying material indicates that the picture is of Burbank, the plant wizard, not Bertino, of course. Another version of that same image was created as a stereoscope card by the Keystone Company. So Bertino, AKA Burbank, and his plants could be seen in three dimensions. And here's the reverse side of the card where they continue to call Burbank uh, the plant wizard. But in fact, he was Mr. Bert Bertino. Burbank also worked with several men who went on to become well-known designers. Leland Noel became a landscape designer and later worked with Mrs. Burbank to create the Burbank Memorial Garden area on the Burbank grounds. As a high school student, Howard Gilkey, pictured here many years later, worked summers with Mr. Burbank pollinating plants. He was enticed into the work by the question, would you like to be a bumblebee? Later, he paid his way through college at Berkeley by taking orders for bulbs for a new variety of gladiolus. The bulbs were given to him by Mr. Burbank. Gilkey went on to design Lakeside Drive in San Francisco and Juilliard Park in Santa Rosa, as well as many landmarks in Oakland. He was the first Western landscape designer named as a member of the American Society of Landscape Architects. Mrs. Burbank herself was another important helper. Her work with Luther Burbank is best described by him. When asked to comment upon how my wife has helped me, he said, words are futile in describing and dealing with the vital things of heart and life. She has been an ever-present helper on the numerous books which I have published. And as a visual aid, we show you an eight volume set, a condensed set of Burbank's works and a 12 volume set uh, that was produced in 1915, both of which Mrs. Burbank helped to produce. Burbank continues, with constant encouragement in ambitions, love, happiness. She is my friend, companion, pal and helper, my philosopher, advisor, stabilizer confidant, counselor, and happy running mate. So now we get to the important stuff. What did Luther Burbank do for fun? Well, we know he enjoyed caressing spineless cactus pads. This was a way he could prove that his spineless cactus were really spineless. And maybe he enjoyed the special celebrations in his honor with enthusiastic children. They seem a little worse for wear here though. <laughs> I'm sure he enjoyed hanging out with young ladies on his front porch. More than likely, he enjoyed cruising down the road in his early auto with his sister, Emma, and a young friend. We know he liked to read in the evenings because we have several photos showing Burbank with a book. He's reading a magazine in the garden in front of those spineless cactus in this picture. 
and reading in a studio produced photograph. And another one. And here we have a more candid photo of Luther Burbank at home in his Tupper Street home with a book. Luther also did some drawing and painting. This painting itself was mentioned and actually published in a Life Magazine article. He traveled also, but not too much. He couldn't stay too long away from his plants. One of his employees, Miss Brownie kept what was what she called a wonder book that captured many candid moments, including is this outing to the hot springs with his sister and another worker, Marie. And here again at the hot springs with his sister's husband, William, Emma, and Luther. At home, he clowned around a bit. He's climbing on the furniture to show off for Brownie's camera. One memorable evening after a visit from Jack London and his new wife, he read a story to his young workers and that left a lasting impression. Young Brownie said, I cannot realize I am daily associated with such a man as the boss, Mr. Burbank. And she wrote her impressions of that visit quite um, sweetly. Mr. Burbank also enjoyed showing off his dog, Bonita. Who had a nice big jump? And of course, he spent time with his wife and her niece, little Betty Jane. He had some dear friends, including Dr. Joseph Shaw, who's pictured here with Luther in the greenhouse. Dr. Shaw always referred to Luther as the big chief and served as his unofficial chauffeur to special events. Of course, we know that Luther's chief pleasure was to be found among his plants, like these gladiolas, shown here in a stereoscope image. And here he is again in his cornfield. Today, Mr. Burbank is buried in front of his Tupper Street home, between his home and Santa Rosa Avenue, beneath a tall cedar of Lebanon tree that he had planted from seed from the Holy Land last century. Burbank was buried beneath the tree because he felt he wanted his memorial to be a living one. He said, don't build a monument plant a tree to remember me. He would sometimes crawl beneath the branches of this tree to enjoy the cool grass on a hot summer's day. His casket was displayed uh, and Mrs. Burbank enclosed some precious things with her husband, souvenirs, of their life together. She included some letters, some drawings from Betty Jane, a porcelain dog, a toy from her own childhood, and a little wooden whistle that Luther had used to call Bonita to him. The original plan for the burial, according to L.B. McGuire, 
of Santa Rosa building materials was to wait until nightfall to bury Luther in a concrete vault beneath the cedar. They had to wait until nightfall because they were unable to get a burial permit to bury Luther Burbank outside of a regular cemetery. McGuire parked his Derek hoist truck on a side street waiting for nightfall. However, at the last minute, a permit arrived and they were able to proceed without subterfuge. Years later, the ashes of several family friends and his wife were interred next to Luther Burbank's burial place. Eleven years after the death of her husband, Elizabeth buried Bonita beneath a royal walnut tree that still stands in Sebastopol, where Luther Burbank and Bonita would nap some afternoons. Bonita was described as one of the most photographed dogs in the world, and she was mentioned in Time Magazine's obituary page. She was only a dog, but her passing touched the hearts of thousands. So what has Burbank left us? What is his legacy? Burbank laid the groundwork for today's horticultural activities. He originated the idea of inventing plants and blazed the trail for plant inventors of today. Through his work, it is said that Burbank advanced the field of horticulture by at least 20 years. For his plums and potato alone, Luther Burbank is among the most successful plant breeders in history. His curiosity and creativity continue to inspire home gardeners and scientists alike. Many of the foods we eat today were influenced by Burbank and Pluots are just one example. Burbank could be considered the grandfather of the Pluot in that he influenced his worker named Will Henderson, who years later worked with a developer of the Pluot. But Burbank was the first to develop a cross between an apricot and a plum, which he dubbed the plum cot, pictured on the last couple slides. While there were no plant patents to protect Burbank's introductions during his lifetime, patents for new or improved plant varieties began to be awarded around 1930. Burbank received 16 patents posthumously, six for plums, six for roses, three for peaches, and one for a cherry. And these were granted to his widow, Elizabeth. And the slide shows the beautiful artwork that accompanied the patent applications. There are still many Burbank plants available today. Generally available cultivars include the Santa Rosa plum, the Burbank, Burbank plum cot, the Shasta daisy, elephant garlic, and the Burbank potato, among others. His legacy is celebrated every day at the acre and a half that remains of his experimental gardens at the corner of Santa Rosa and Sonoma Avenues. And we invite you to, to visit Luther Burbank Home and Gardens as well as the Goldrich Farm in Sebastopol to enjoy the gardens, take a tour, and learn more about Luther Burbank. Nice last slide of Luther Burbank. That was so much information um that you packed into this webinar lisa and rebecca thank you so much uh so much that we didn't know right and i am sure that as we give a little time to our participants 
uh, we may have a few questions, but just to start off the questions right now, um, I will remind our participants that you can key in your questions here on Zoom live uh, in the webinar by putting them in our chat, and I'll facilitate those questions with our presenters, both Rebecca and Lisa. And if you are joining us on Facebook Live simultaneously right now, you can key in your questions in the comment area, and our administrator will then key them in here on Zoom so I can facilitate those questions as well. But we'll start it off with a, a, a question for both of you. I'm curious, uh, as you are both docents at uh, the Luther Burbank Home and Gardens, uh, what is your favorite Burbank plant? Mm -hmm. mm. I would say I like the amaranthus just because it's a beautiful plant. And I try to always plant that in my yard as well. Mm. Well, I go traditional. I like the Shasta Daisy, mainly because there are so many varieties today that um, you can have a dozen different Shastas, all with different characteristics. And I know Burbank would have enjoyed that variety and seeing how they, seeing which ones do better in which locations, they're just fun. They are fun. They're happy plants. Um, although I do see a lot of the amaranthus, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, in Santa Rosa Gardens. Um, and I don't believe, being that I was originally from uh, Southern California, I don't remember seeing that plant until I moved up here um, over 20 years ago. And then I was like, what the world is that? And it was fun to learn that it was uh, a Luther Burbank variety. So got some information here, um, just some comments that are coming in first and, so, and a question. Uh, thanks, Karen. Karen is just saying that it was a great job that both of you did. And it was an excellent job. It's just a world of information. And I know that by visiting the Luther Burbank Home and Gardens, I'm sure that uh, some of this information can also come to life. So it's great to know that all of this is right there at our fingertips. It's here in Santa Rosa, basically in our backyard, um, such a world renowned place. And uh, we also have from Mark, a wonderful um, information. And he wants to know um, what happened to Mr. Burbank's grave after the cedar of Lebanon was removed a few years ago. And uh, was there a new tree planted? No, there was not a new tree planted on the same spot. The tree was removed um, because it had uh, grown old and diseased and a new tree was not planted on the spot. Uh, we think of the gardens as a whole as the memorial to Mr. Burbank today until indeed there is actually a formal Burbank Memorial Garden, but his gravesite remains unadorned with a tree or a marker. Thank you. That was a great question right there. Um, just a quick question coming in as well. We've got uh, what can one, what can all of us really do to help and maintain the legacy of Luther Burbank? I'll give that to you. No, you take that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the things that we can do to help maintain his legacy is to volunteer at the gardens if you have time to garden or to garden at home with um, his plants or other historic plants to keep some of those historic varieties alive um, means a great deal and to just enjoy and learn from your garden really keeps a lot of his ethos alive. Most definitely. And a question from Facebook. Thanks again to our Facebook viewers that are joining us. Uh, we are broadcasting this live simultaneously on Facebook. And I also want to point out that we will have a recording on the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's YouTube page um, that'll be posted uh, probably within 24 hours of the conclusion of this webinar. So our Facebook a question comes from Jane. Uh, why did he come to Santa Rosa specifically? 
Well, he had a brother, Alfred, who was already living in Santa Rosa, and two of his half-brothers were living in Marin County. So that was a natural reason for him to come to Santa Rosa, as well as the fact that the climate would allow him to conduct plant experimentations all year round instead of just during the spring and summer, as was the case in Massachusetts. One of the things Burbank did when he came out to California was walk around and um, explore Marin and Sonoma County. And he decided that he wanted to focus on Santa Rosa, which he called the chosen spot of all the earth as far as nature was concerned. And that encouraged his mother and sister to come out here as well. Yeah, encouraged quite a few notables to come to Santa Rosa. Um, you mentioned a few. Uh, royalty even, um, but we also had Diego Rivera, right? He and Frida Kahlo visited after Burbank's death, and he was commissioned to do a mural in San Francisco, and part of that mural called the Allegory of California was um, uh, Burbank. So Burbank was featured in that mural. And so he came to Santa Rosa and visited with Mrs. Burbank to uh, learn more about Burbank and see where Burbank conducted his work. And I think he took at least one photo with him uh, that he used as a model for his work in that mural. And I think uh, Frida Kahlo took at least one photo with her and used that as a model for her work that she entitled Portrait of Luther Burbank. And if you haven't seen it, just Google it and you'll get a sense of why um, you know now because of our presentation, why she presented Luther Burbank the way he did, the way she did. That's great. So, um, and, and that's a great example of Luther Burbank uh, having that prestige to bring people to uh, Santa Rosa and Sonoma County, not just while he was with us, but also long after. And even today, a good many visitors come just to look at the gardens. Mm -hmm. So another um, from Marsha here, she's saying that uh, definitely she must say that Rebecca and Lisa has done, they've, you've done a wonderful job with this presentation. And she wants to thank you both um, and that you both helped to validate what she had already known um, about Luther Burbank as a docent um, at the Luther Burbank Home and Gardens. And, uh, and, <laughs> and, and yes, hopefully they did plant a seed or two um, during this, do this presentation so that more people will volunteer at the Home and Gardens and uh, keep this leg legacy alive. So thank you for pointing that out, Marcia. Uh, Karen Stone also is pointing out that Henry Ford and Helen Keller visited Burbank. Um, while he was alive here in Santa Rosa. So that must have been something. Um, it sounds like he was somewhat of a, also like to tinker, it sounds like. Um, if you have a bicycle, you have to know how to tinker a little bit because it's going to break down at some point. And you've got to know how to fix it, right? Um, and also with cars at the time. So um, it would be would have been great to be a little bit of a fly on the wall or a Shasta Daisy in the garden to listen to what uh, Henry Ford and Luther Burbank chatted about. Uh, Mark says that he understands that Mr. Burbank joined Thomas Edison and Henry Ford on at least one camping trip. Were there more of these trips together that you know about? There were no trips together, unfortunately. Luther Burbank didn't leave home to go camping with Ford and Edison. Although he, he was, was invited. invited, he yeah. was invited and we had a beautiful, beautiful photo album that was produced from a, a foray that Edison went on with John Burroughs along the East Coast, showing them camping. I'm going to put that in, can I put out air quotes in, into the world here? Um, because they camped on sort of luxurious um, fold out, um, what do you call those? Fold out cots with uh, duvets and uh, pillows and such. And they had tablecloths for their tables uh, while they had lovely outdoor so-called picnics. 
It was the it was the OG of glamping, I believe. Yes. It was. It yeah. Was very very glampalicious. <laughs> yes. Um, and and Denise would like to have you talk to us a little bit about the connection of Luther Burbank and Arbor Day. Well, Arbor Day in California is celebrated on March 7th, which is Luther Burbank's birthday. Can add on to that? I can. <laughs> it was originated, um, I believe, by a group of teachers, a teachers association in the early part of the last century, and they advocated for Arbor Day uh, on Luther Burbank's birthday. Today it's Arbor, this now it's Arbor Week, I believe, on the week of his birthday. Yeah, and I, I do believe that the city of Santa Rosa actually um, annually uh, recognizes Arbor Day and the Rec and Parks Department actually uh, encourages people to come out and participate in planting trees. I believe in 2023, they did so at, I wanna say MLK Park over um, uh, kind of in the South Park area. Mm -hmm. that sounds right. So um, it's always a, a, a good event to enjoy. It's a very family friendly and it's um, fun to always plant a tree, planting for the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, with the home and gardens, what, do, what more do you wanna tell us about the home and gardens now? Um, and maybe what it's like to work there, uh, you know, what hours it's open, how we can learn a little bit more about potentially volunteering. So I do want to mention that it is a city park and the city actually owns the property today. It was donated to the city by Mrs. Burbank as part of her will. In fact, she donated it to the city while she was alive and had a life tenancy to live on the property. It's, it's maintained by the city, uh, but it's heart and soul is the volunteers and all of the programs are managed and funded by the volunteers and the nonprofit that supports them. Mm -hmm. You asked about the hours. Um, Burbank Gardens is open daily from dawn to dusk. The gates are open and the house is available for tours on Tuesday through Sunday. So we're closed on Mondays. Uh, in the afternoons from one o'clock to four o'clock and on Fridays and Saturdays it's open at 10 a.m. for morning tours as well as afternoon tours. Mm -hmm. And am I, am I correct in understanding that there's also self-guided tours still? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are usually brochures on the carriage house that one can grab and take a self-guided tour as well as an audio tour outside uh, if you have a cell phone. The uh, docent led tours take you inside the house and greenhouse, um, but the self-guided tours and audio tours are a fun way to experience the property as well. Yeah, just the gardens. Yeah, and do that when we're closed. We have an off season from October through March. Or we don't and do what about the, the Goldridge Farm? Mm -hmm. There are three acres that remain of the original 18 acres at the Goldridge Farm. <laughs> They have some tours, I want to say, is it Wednesdays? I, I know you can go and take a self-guided tour mm -hmm. most days, mm -hmm. but check out uh, the West Sonoma County Historical Society website for the Luther Burbank uh, Experimental Farm and Goldridge Farm in Sebastopol for more detailed information. And is there a resource that including the home and gardens um, uh, that you would suggest to people if they're interested in finding out more about Luther Burbank? So, of course, we have our website at lutherburbank.org. Um, there's also a book called A Gardener Touched with Genius that we use quite a lot. And another book by Jane Smith called A Garden of Inventions. That's a very accessible book and talks about Luther Burbank and other contemporaries. Um, some of the things that were going on during his lifetime. Um, it's very readable, won an award for best, I think, Western history writing, something like that. So 
that's a good source as well. If you're interested in looking at more photographs, the Sonoma County Library has uh, photographed most of the photos in our archive and it's available through their local history section. And we're called a partner with the local history section. So you look under partners and you'll find Luther Burbank Home and Gardens and you can look at hundreds and hundreds of photos. If you're interested in some more details, through the University of Wisconsin Digital Archives, the Burbank um, 12 volume set called Methods and Discoveries is available. It's all digitized, very nice search functionality there. So you can focus on different topics or different plants. And it also has hundreds and hundreds of photographs that were taken uh, in 19, probably 1908 to 1915 or so. And they are gorgeous photos, just to look at those as well. We used a few of them here in the slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lots of great photos in this and it'll be something that I know folks are gonna want to view again. So I do wanna mention that this webinar presentation is recorded and it will be uploaded onto the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's uh, YouTube page. And of course, visit the Historical Society of Santa Rosa um, website at historicalsocietysantarosa.org um, to learn more about their Facebook page, their YouTube page, and about the organization itself. I don't wanna leave out the kids. We've, we've talked a lot about Luther Burbank, and I know that many people who have grown up in Santa Rosa have probably visited the Luther Burbank Garden Home and Gardens um, as an uh, elementary school student. Do you have you still have a lot of elementary school students and classes coming through um, the gardens? We do. We offer children's tours, and I know. Uh, certain grade levels, is it third grade, maybe third. fourth grade, uh, those classes um, tend to come to uh, visit the gardens as well. Yeah. And we had a certain, we had a special um, activities on Earth Day as well. So there are, there are certain activities that are geared towards youngsters as well in the gardens. Every time we have an open house, which is usually sometime around Mother's Day and the, the first weekend in December, we always have a holiday open house. All of those open house type um, events always have a kid's table where there's some crafting, that sort of things. And the nice thing about the open houses is you can go through the rooms at your own pace with docents in the rooms. So kids, sometimes they're interested in one room and not another room where they have their own pacing needs or they need to get out of the house for whatever reason, you can go at your own speed. And we usually have some kind of cookies or um, uh, refreshments as well. So those are good times to bring kids. Also, anytime's a good time to just enjoy the park. And we notice as docents and volunteers there that people come often for their high school graduation pictures and their quinceanera pictures sometimes wedding photos. So it's always always nice to, and also little babies come, people bring their youngsters to do lots of early photos with their kids. So that's all yeah. wonderful to see as well. I definitely have seen um, people take uh, photos and use the the gardens as a backdrop mm -hmm. for, their, for their photos. Um, want to make sure that we get this in from Marsha. It's a, a really charming uh, bit that she has to share here. And um, she's talking about her grandmother and her great aunt, who's Mary Ross, who owned a store on the site of the corner of Ware Street off of Petaluma Hill Road. And they would pass by Luther Burbank's home um, and engage in conversation and idea swapping, swapping. So a little brainstorming going on as she walked into town on Santa Rosa and Main Street, which is now Santa Rosa Avenue. And this took place in the early 1920s. And as a child, uh, Marsha, while she was growing up in the 1950s, can recall that the cedar of Lebanon tree was the actual Christmas tree lighting tree for the holiday season. Um, and until that, until that tree, unfortunately, had to be taken away. So um, those are great memories uh, about 
just kind of the local history and um, the connection to Luther Burbank. I also want to talk about two, a couple other things with the home and gardens. One is the plant sale. I know recently there was a plant sale. Um, talk a little bit about uh, how many plant sales there are a year, if there's more than one, um, how people can know when that's coming up. Well, usually we have a plant sale around Mother's Day this year. It was the weekend before, before. Mother's Day, the Saturday. And we also have plant sales every day. We have uh, carts out with some plants that are divisions from plants that are in, uh, in the ground. Uh, some plants that were grown from seed for the gardens and they're just excess. And some, you know, that come from um, um, donations we've been given and that sort of thing. So there are plants usually available almost every day. Uh, special sales will be advertised usually on our, um, what do you call it? The board out in front of the, the corner of <laughs> Sonoma Avenue and uh, Santa Rosa Avenue and on our website as well. And our Facebook page. And our Facebook page. Yeah, definitely. Good to, good to mention to follow the Facebook page um, and stay up to date on what is going on. And, um, and you have other things for sale too in the gift shop as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we try to get unique items that are related to Santa Rosa, sometimes developed by people who are artists or craftspeople here in Santa Rosa. And we have images, um, some that are historic or some that are contemporary or done by artists for t-shirts and booklets and those sorts of things. And on plant sale days, they always bring in extra items too as well. So try to have unique gift items available. So speaking of the legacy of Luther Burbank, um, if I'm correct, he didn't have children of his own. That's correct. And so are there relatives? Um, he had an extensive family uh, on the East Coast. Uh, are, there, are there relatives alive today? There are. And in fact, we have one of his... Burbank's brother's descendants, who is a volunteer docent um, with the gardens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Burbank had two older brothers who were out here, two older half brothers, and they had children. And he had a older half sister who came out here as well. And she also had children. Uh, I don't know where those children are today, but there were a lot of Burbanks in the area at one point, but he didn't have children and neither of his mother's other two children had children. Luther and Alfred and Emma did not have children. Well, fascinating information. Um, is there any other information that you just wish that you would have, um, I know a couple of times you did say, we're not gonna share all of that information, um, <laughs> but is there is there any information that you just wish that Maybe another webinar is going to happen at some point and you'll dive into more information on a, on a topic that is a little bit more detailed within the history of Luther Burbank. You can, there's, there, there is so much to talk about. There. So many different aspects of his life from, you know, publishing of his books to speeches that he gave mm -hmm. to, yes, specifics on other types of plants, visitors who came. Yeah, there's lots of uh, lots of different connections to Burbank, and his um, his work was known widely. So he had correspondence with people from around the world. Most of Burbank's materials um, that were left um, in, in terms of paper materials, documentation, and uh, catalogs and those sorts of things were given to the Library of Congress. So that's where the bulk of those materials are today, but we have quite an extensive archives as well. So we're always finding new things and people are turning up with new pictures and information. So yeah, actually, if I had anything to say, it would be <laughs> look in your attics, see what you've got. And we're always uh, happy to learn new things about um, um, Burbank's time here in Santa Rosa. That's great. It would be great, wouldn't it? If somebody came out of this webinar and said, oh my gosh, 
I've had this for so long. It, it, my grandmother had it or whatnot. Maybe Marsha has something well, right there. Marsha that gave us that, that great story. Uh, maybe she has have, something. We don't have any recording of Mr. Burbank's voice. And it is mm. possible that it exists because he was uh, broadcast on the radio several times. We actually have a picture of him with um, a woman holding a microphone and they're in front of a, an airplane. Mm. Uh, so something was being broadcast at one point there too. So it's possible he was recorded and we'd love to find any evidence of that. Oh, that would be, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to um, switch slides now. Uh, Mark, is, Mark is just saying, thank you so much. Such a great program um, to both of you. And uh, did you want to say anything about this picture? Where is he standing here? Is this on it? <laughs> no. before we um, leave it? The tree that's in the on the right hand side, um, that's actually the Cedar of Lebanon, I think. So that's where he was later buried beneath. And he's, oh, did we figure out? Yeah, we figured out actually this is yeah. um, right outside the greenhouse door facing um, west. So he's outside, there is a door there today. So he's outside the greenhouse. Um, he's probably 20 steps south of where the house is today. So he's looking out over the gardens that are kind of his front front yard. It's a great, it's a great shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's pretty iconic right there. So thanks for sharing that one. And I think this is bringing us pretty much to our conclusion. Um, it has been a wonderful presentation, so much information. Again, folks are going to want to watch this again. You're going to want to tell your friends and your family uh, about this, uh, no matter where they are. If they're in Santa Rosa, in Northern California, or across the country, they can watch and listen to this webinar. It will be posted as a recording on the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's YouTube page. Um, Marsh is getting in one last quick bit of information here. She said that she was at the gardens today and there was a visitor who came from Minnesota who um, has access to Luther Luther Burbank's books that were in his family and that she'll be contacting the both of you. Um, and uh, with additional information of what she has. So look for that. Oh, Marsha, Marsha must have heard me right there when I said maybe she has something. She knows somebody who has something, which is great. I um, love to make that kind of connection here. Thank you, Marsha, for bringing that information to us and securing that with uh, that visitor from Minnesota. So, so friends, be sure to check out the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. They bring you these free webinars. It is just something that you can really sink your teeth into with some information about Santa Rosa, how it used to be, and uh, learn a little bit, uh, maybe even discover a little bit of information about your background through these webinars as well. Uh, as you check out their website, historicalsocietysantarosa.org, be sure to even make a contribution. $10 or as much as you can uh, helps to bring these free webinars to you. And you can also join. Uh, become a member today of the Historical Society of Santa Rosa at their website as you see it on the bottom of the page. And be sure to follow them on Facebook as well as their YouTube page where you'll see a recording of this webinar. Thank you again to everybody, both on Zoom and Facebook Live, for attending tonight's webinar. Our next one is going to be on July 20th. And also at 6 p.m., we're going to be talking about tank houses and water towers. And we'll probably be talking about that one that I know is sitting right over there in Railroad Square that needs a little bit of help to get it back up and function. Not really functional. We just want it to be a marquee kind of a thing. And I think that was the word you were looking for earlier. You've got that marquee outside of Luther Burbank Home and Gardens to tell people what um, is happening at the gardens. And the tank houses and water towers will be uh, brought to you by Historical Society of Santa Rosa again on Thursday, July 20th at 6 p.m. So be sure to go to their website, 
follow them on Facebook and learn more about how to keep your eye out for not only these webinars, but many more of the events that Historical Society of Santa Rosa brings to you throughout the year. Thanks again to Rebecca and Lisa, our presenters this evening, uh, for giving us so much information. We feel like uh, almost don't have to read a book about Luther Burbank if you watch this webinar, but encourage everybody to go out there and keep learning a little bit more. And everybody, stay safe tonight, and we'll see you next time, July 20th, 2023, 6 p.m. for Tank Houses and Water Towers. Thanks again to Historical Society of Santa Rosa for bringing us these free webinars. Good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>